I'm going to be teaching an herbal preparation class. Um, and, you know, one of, I love teaching this class, by the way. One of the funnest things for me, actually the two funnest things in teaching herbalism is the wild plants, you know, teaching people plant identification, the medicinal ed edible uses. I could really literally spend all day out looking at plants and often have. And I love sharing what I know with others and learning from others. I learned some really great things today on the herb walk. So thank you for sharing. And then the other thing I love doing is making it practical and real for people. Um, you know, just teaching people how to make these things. They're absolutely simple. Actually, there's very few things in the whole herbal preparation that's challenging or difficult. If you know how to cook, like you can bake a cookie or, I don't know, maybe make a pesto even. You'll, you can make any herbal product. That's how simple it is. And I have a whole spectrum of products that we're going to make today. We had a little bit of a snafu, um, and we're trying to gather a few things. But uh, even without everything, I think I can still do this. <laughs> you know, why not? That's the whole nature of thriving, right? Not surviving, but really just making what you can do work. So I just wanted to start by saying I'm grateful for the organizers and grateful for all of you who've come to this beautiful place and everything that's being shared. You know, I, I love that so many different people have come together and you know we're all able just to be together in peace love and harmony <laughs> yeah it's a great feeling so um i so i wanted to share with you, you know i i have been um an herbalist really since my early 20s i began my practice and i I've, I've been doing it for almost 50 years i i've worked one-on-one -on -one in a clinical setting mostly and i've done that for many years and um but mostly what i love doing is sharing with people this knowledge and and really reminding people that this is our heritage, that you know, it was that everybody used herbal medicine at one time. It was part of, you know, what we did, like growing food and and um, you know, getting together for potlucks. So people just made herbal medicine and they shared with one another. And it's so beautiful to see that tradition happening again. I like to remind us in America that actually, um, it's only been a few years since really right after World War II that herbalism went deeply underground in this country. In most other parts of the world, it continued to flourish. Um, you know, but in America, like so many of the natural things, eating healthily, taking good care of our land, you know, a lot of the crafts that people did, like knitting and crocheting and all that, just fell out of use and people weren't doing it anymore. And really, some of those things were the best of what we are, you know, like they really were really great skills for us to know and to lose those. And, and then to make some of them like completely, you know, people like with herbalism made it, made the, you know, it was passed around that this was antiquated and it didn't work. And I would just scratch my head and think, have people even tried herbs? I mean, like, why don't you just take a cup of Cascara Sagrada and tell me that it doesn't, herbs don't work, you know? <laughs> Cascara Sagrada is a laxative and one cup of it will send you to the toilet. It's like many, many times. Or how about just even a few grains of cayenne, which is a very important medicinal plant. And all of a sudden, you know, you're choking from the heat and guitars running and your bowels are, you know, it, the herbs have been so potent. And they work very differently than modern medicine. Our modern medicine, our allopathic medicine, is also an incredible system and has done much to save people's lives. The, pro the only problem with it is it disempowers people, right? Like we were taught that the doctor knows best about your human body and they do know a lot, they're trained, and they, they train sometimes for 12 and years and longer, and many of them work a long time, and are very, very dedicated to healing. So I never like to put down any of our, of our traditional healing methods, or our, our modern healing methods, but you know, really, when it comes to making decisions about your body and what your body needs, really nobody knows better than you do what your body needs. You might need guidance and help, which is why we have herbalists and doctors and naturopaths, and therapists that we go to. But you are the final decision maker about your body. And so it's that the disempowerment that we had, I felt was harmful for us as a nation. And also the fact that the world's oldest healing tradition, oh, bless my little sister's heart. Thank you, Betty, put these down. This is my younger sister, Betty, and my older sister, Diane. I'm so honored to have them here with us. They'll be helping me out in this class, so. No, but I think uh, I think Larry. No, I think but I think they went. <laughs> I think they went to try to find that for us. So um, the other let's see, so I was she broke my train of thought again. <laughs> that Betty. <laughs> um, um, so so 
one of the things that I'd like us to recognize that herbalism is still the most widely used system of healing in the world, and not just in developing countries, by the way, but in very sophisticated countries where they appreciate modern medicine, but they also recognize the value of traditional medicine. Traditional medicine is actually herbal medicine, not modern medicine. It's based on hundreds of years of use. And um, so the World Health Organization stated that, and this was back in the 1980s, at their first big meeting, that 82% of the world's population still uses herbs as a primary system of healing, not secondary. If you've ever had the good fortune to travel in any of the European countries, Switzerland, Italy, France, any country, England, Ireland, Wales, they all use herbal medicine still, it's still very acceptable. And in fact, in a lot of the countries in Europe, when you go into a pharmaceutical, a drugstore as we call them, which I think is a terrible name for them, pharmaceutical store, you will always find herbal remedies, you'll find often bulk herbs, you'll find homeopathic remedies, you'll find flower essence right along with the drugs. Isn't that a great system of healing? Yeah. You go in, let's say you have a really bad cold and you go into a pharmacy in Italy or a pharmacy in England or France, you have a choice of pine needle syrup, elderberry syrup, you know, you have a whole array of herbal products. And the pharmacists there are trained in herbal, in fact, the ones so the pharmacists there, if they're really advanced, they are also trained in herbal remedies and herbal medicine as well. So I just think it's important to realize that in our country, herbalism went deeply underground from around the 1940s, right after World War II, when a massive amounts of chemicals were introduced into our culture. And our medicine became based on, on drugs, really. You know, um, People like to point out that many of the pharmaceuticals were based, they were based on uh, plant chemicals for certain, but very few of them are today. There's still a few, like golden seal, uh, hydrastine, and can, uh, hydrastine and berberine, which is extracted, are still used, in a, and they use the golden seal as a base, are still used in a lot of the pharmaceutical preparations, sadly, because golden seal is a highly endangered plant in the United States. So. I don't know that you need to know that, but it's just interesting you know, to, to observe some of those things. So yeah, it's most widely used. It's also our oldest tradition of healing. You know, I think the only thing that came before that was maybe the laying on of hands, you know, people reaching out to help one another and with heartful medicine. But it's the oldest system of healing that we have in the world, herbalism. So if you're interested in it and you train in it, by the way, training in it doesn't mean you have to go to schools. It doesn't mean you have to have a degree. You can be studying with your grandma or your neighbor. You just learn it. The herbalism is not a professional title that you have to have a degree to be. So you can train to be a clinical herbalist and then work in a clinical situation like a homeopath or a naturopath or with a doctor, etc. cetera. Um, but you can also be a home herbalist, which is what I am. I practice herbalism at home, helping my family members, my community, anybody who knocks on my door. You know, I am a family herbalist, so I didn't have to get a degree. <laughs> you know, I got one just because I started schools, but no, I guess I got my own degrees, right? I just like to point that out because herbalism is a profession, but it's really uh, also a home profession. Just like you can be a professional chef, right? But you can be a cook, and you can be a darn good cook in your home, right? And all your neighbors want to come over for your potlucks. <laughs> so herbalism, that's the type of herbalism that I like to practice. So. Part of that, of course, is bringing it at home and learning to make your own remedies. So this is another thing that I have really advocated for for the last 50 years. Is herbalism, to me, is a people's medicine. It should be affordable, it should be understandable, and it should be available. And so one of the ways that we make it affordable is by learning to make our own medicine. And I can tell you absolutely, this little girl up here who started lots of big companies and has made you know, professional tinctures and big fancy tea companies, I want to tell you that you can absolutely make the best medicine in your home. So you don't need a lot of, you know, you don't need a lot of scales and measurements and you just need a good kitchen and a few, like a good kitchen like this, a table and a few things that you mix up. So that's kind of what I want to show you today, how to make really, really good medicine at home and why that's important. Like you don't have to be doing it, right? You may not like, it may not be your cup of tea, I like to say. You may not like making herbal medicine. I always like to teach people how because I don't want this to be a dying art. I want this to be a living art. I want people to know how to do this again. 
But if it's not your cup of tea, like I don't wanna make a big mess and get all sticky in my kitchen, there's lots of companies and lots of neighbors that are making it for you. But the reason that it's important is because it keeps it really affordable. So an example might be, let's say Echinacea, which I call the great diplomat, right? When, Echin when Echinacea was introduced to the American public again, because of course the native peoples used it, traditional peoples used it, the early pioneers used it who learned it from the native people, and then the early settlers used it. But again, from around 1940, Americans weren't using it. But we were shipping massive tonnage of it to European companies that were using Echinacea, um, which is a North American native plant. So when Echinacea was reintroduced to the American public in the 1980s, it was good enough tasting, not delicious, but good enough tasting that people would be willing to try it. It was also effective. It actually, you know, it, it's a first line of defense when you get a bacterial or microbial, um, an, a bacterial or viral infection. So what Echinacea does, and you can actually see this in blood work, is if you take a good dose of echinacea, it stimulates white blood cell activity. It gets your white blood cells off the couch. A lot of times they're really sluggish, they're sitting around, they're not doing their work. It gets them activated. So it activates the immune system, the white blood cells. And those white cell, blood cells circulate better when you take echinacea. So they're on patrol and they're able to attack that virus or the bacteria that's in your blood. So that just happened. People would take echinacea and it worked. And so echinacea spread pretty fast. And it, how many of you used echinacea? Yeah, and really, I always say echinacea is the plant that reintroduced the American public to herbalism. We were ready for it, but it was really that plant. Also, it grows beautifully, right? How many, oh, thank you, honey. So um, it grows beautifully in the United States, you know, all, throughout all this region. You can plant it in your garden. So lots of gardeners knew echinacea, so they weren't afraid of using it either. But let's say you have a bad cold and you have a one ounce bottle. It costs about 12 to $15 for those little one ounce bottles. And really for echinacea to keep a cold away, you need to take about a half a teaspoon of that about every hour or every couple hours for it to really work, right? But if you look at the bottle, it usually says like 30 drops or something, right? Three times a day. If you follow that, you're probably gonna get a cold. But if you take it, frequently, regularly, it's gonna kick your immune system into action and your immune system, your white blood cells, are going to attack that invading virus or bacteria. And it works really well. But who can afford that much in echinacea? I always used to say, you know, you have to fight with your husband for it or decide if you're gonna get sick or your kids are gonna get sick. Because, you know, you'll be through a one ounce bottle in a day. But if you make a quart of it every year, which is what I recommend for a family, make a quart. Grow your echinacea, make a quart of it, and then you have enough for your family through the winter. Do you need more honey, Janice? Well, that would be nice, but if you don't Does need... anybody have honey? They want to donate to this cause. We need a little more honey. I can use that. It's just to make the syrup. And then honey. Yeah, that's good, too. Yeah, I have little spoons and I'll take No, that's good. Everything's good. Okay, any honey, honey? I have a honey. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Then we can make the elderberry syrup in front of everybody. So, yeah, then I think we're... Nothing else. This is good. Yeah, we're good. Thank you so much, Betty. So um, so that's why you want to learn to make your own medicine, right? You just, it's so cost, of, uh, cost effective when you make it yourself. And of course, the question is, can I make it as good as what I buy? And really, honestly, you can. Um, you, you, you can. You know, it takes a little bit of skill, and it might take a couple of echinacea bottles to make it, but you can. So why don't we just start with making a tincture? So I'm going to teach you the folkloric method. So when I ran herb companies where I would make products to sell, I had to use what was called a standardized method. I had to weigh everything out. I had to determine the amount of alcohol to percentage of herb. I'm terrible with math. I hated doing that, but you had to do that in order to be able to sell the product legally. But every time I'm in my kitchen and I'm just making my own tinctures, which I make all the time, I make it this way that I'm gonna show you. I forget the math tablets, tables. I forget the measuring. I just do it this really simple way. So I wouldn't do it this way if it didn't work. So this is what I do. We're gonna make a tincture. So the first thing I wanna say, a tincture is a concentrated liquid extract of an herb into a solvent. And you have literally, in the folk tradition, you have three choices of solvents. 
You have alcohol, which I know some of you don't appreciate using alcohol. Here we're talking about, you know, a brandy or a gin or, or an Everclear. So you have alcohol. So the advantage of alcohol is it, it lasts forever. It's a powerful solvent. It really extracts a great deal of the constituents of the plant into the liquid, and it can really concentrate it. So you have a very powerful solvent. The disadvantages is it doesn't, not everybody wants to drink alcohol. Some people don't want to give alcohol even in small amounts to their children. Some people are addicts, and I personally feel, even though it's a very tiny amount of alcohol that you're giving somebody who might have alcoholism, I never felt like you should because that's really a toxin and a poison for them, and I would prefer not to use alcohol. So then we have other choices. We have vinegar, and we usually use choose apple cider vinegar. Vinegar is a food. It's actually a really healthy, if you get raw, unfiltered vinegar, it's actually a living substance that introduces pro and prebiotics to your system. It is an acid, but it actually is alkalining to the system. Don't try to figure that out. When your body, when your body digests this, apple cider vinegar and lemon, it actually burns into an alkaline ash. So it actually alkalizes the system. It makes your system less desirable for unhealthy bacteria. So it's a very healthy ingredient. A lot of times people use apple cider vinegar uh, as a base for a lot of their medicine. So this can also be used. The disadvantage is it doesn't have quite as long a shelf life as alcohol does, does it? But it lasts a lot longer than the books tell you. You know, when you put a jar of apple cider vinegar on your shelf, it lasts for months, sometimes years. The only thing that might happen is it gets a good mother in it. It gets that big slimy mother. And that big slimy mother tells you it's a living substance. There's nothing wrong with it. It is a little yucky to drink it. So, you, you know, I always try to pour it off, but not pour it off. I try to pour off the tincture on it. But to me, I've, I've, made, alcohol, I've made vinegar tinctures that have lasted for years. The books will usually say six months to a year, but I'm just telling you that usually they last far longer than that. The other disadvantage is that vinegar is not as strong a solvent or menstruum is the other term for the liquid as alcohol. So you just have to know that. It's not going to extract the properties as much as the alcohol, but it has its advantages. It's a food. Anytime that you're making a tonic, let's say you're growing up, you want to make rosemary and thyme and sage, all medicinal herbs, you want to make them into a tonic, using vinegar is always a better idea than alcohol. And our third tincture is glycerin. You see glycerites in health food stores. I didn't bring... Excuse me. I didn't bring one to make for you, but you see glycerites in in um, herb stores and you know on the internet and stuff. So glycerin, do you know what glycerin is? You see it in your soaps, right? <laughs> so glycerin is a chemical constituent of all fats and oils. It's extracted from vegetable fats and from animal fats. I so um, I generally recommend for medicinal purposes is using vegetable glycerin. It's not that I disapprove of animal glycerin, it's just not as high a quality as a veg for internal purposes as a vegetable glycerin would be. A vegetable glycerin is a food grade glycerin that's meant to be taken internally and an animal glycerin is not food grade, it's meant to be used in soap making. So it's a thick viscid, you would never think, I wish I had brought one for you to share, you would never think it came out of oil because it's thick, viscidy, and very sweet. It's sweeter than honey. So it's oftentimes used for children and for really old people who don't like bitters or you know alcohol or vinegar. And the, um, so the advantage is, is that it's sweet and it's viscidy. The viscidy makes it soothing when you take it. The disadvantages are it's not a good solvent. It really doesn't extract a lot. It's not going to, it extracts some, I shouldn't say that. It's not as good as vinegar or alcohol. Um, and it has a shelf life that's about the same as vinegar. It will last a fairly long time, but not definitely not long as alcohol. So those three solvents, you can choose what you want. I'm just, do you understand that? And maybe the other, did, I make, did that make sense to you? I, it's important when you understand making tincture making. Now, the, here's a little bit that's complicated, and I've had a couple questions about this, about using Everclear or pure grain alcohol. So stay with me if you can on this. So you, I don't know if you can go into to alcohol liquor stores here and buy Everclear or Pure Grain. So Everclear is a brand of Pure Grain. Pure Grain means 
that it's almost 100% alcohol. It's like 190% alcohol. It's really strong. You never need that kind of strength to extract plant parts. When people make tinctures from Everclear or the pure grain alcohol, they dilute it. So you're buying a straight alcohol and then you're diluting it. And you're diluting it down almost always to a 40% or 60% alcohol. Um, there are a few herbs, like let's say we wanted to make a gum resin or we were picking the poplar buds, right, that are very rich in propolis and very gummy and very thick. Or you had frankincense or copal or that resin from the pine tree and we wanted to extract that. That is not water soluble. That you need a really strong alcohol to do that. So then I might choose a really high percentage of alcohol. But when students and friends have brought me up their tinctures, you know, oh, try this, and I take a little sip of their pure grain alcohol, it's, that's deadly. You know, you die from drinking pure grain alcohol. So people buy that because it gives them control of how much percentage of alcohol to water they're using. But for beginners and intermediates and for homemaking, I always say either just get brandy, gin, or vodka if you're using an alcohol. They are naturally in these bottles either 50% or 40% alcohol and then either 40 or 60% water. They don't add water, it's in, inherent in the distillation process. And that extracts almost every herb that you have, all right? So let me, make, let me try to bring that down again. So when I go into the store and I buy this brandy and it says it's 80 proof, the proof means half the proof is the percentage of alcohol in here. They use that term proof actually back in the 1500s because people were always you know, making poor alcohol and alcohol was taxed. Even in the 1500s England it was taxed. And so people wanted to prove how much alcohol and so they would put the alcohol in a container and they'd light it on fire. And if it had about 40 to 50 percent alcohol, then they would say it it was proved, it had the proof of the alcohol. And they used the proof also in the um, prohibition days here. You don't really need to know that, but it's kind of interesting. We're the only country now in the world that still use proofs. Everybody else uses percentage of alcohol to water. But here you can still see the proof on here. So brandy, vodka, and gin, all, so this is a 50, this is a 100% 100 proof gin. So what's the percentage of alcohol in here? 50%, and the other percent is water. And here is an 80 proof brandy, so the proof, the percentage of alcohol, 40, and the percentage of water is 60. That is a perfect medium for almost everything that you're gonna extract. You'll get really good tinctures from that. Because water, I haven't even talked about water as a menstruum. Water is one of the best menstruums that we have. It extracts most of the plant constituents, except gummy resins. Those gum resins and the volatile oils are very hard. But water, what's the disadvantage of water? No shelf life. It has no shelf life. So when you make a water product, you have to drink it within three days. So tinctures, by their nature, have alcohol and water in them. Does that make sense to you? Did I answer that enough? Okay, great. So now let's get down to business. Let's make a tincture. So I am making, I could go out and gather fresh yarrow I thought about that. I could gather, what were some of the other plants that we saw? We, could, we didn't talk about the incredible Oregon grape root, but I could have dug up some Oregon grape root, which is an incredible medicinal plant that you have only growing in the Pacific Northwest. Only place that it grows. Yeah, it's an incredible plant. So we could have dug up some of the root and made an Oregon grape root tincture, but I'm gonna make one of my favorite tinctures, which is, because <laughs> I gotta leave it with my sisters. It's called Brain Tonic. And it's made. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm always saying, brain tonic. I think I think a lot about brain tonics now as I'm reaching my mid 70s. Right? <laughs> you need a little help with your memory, but but I'm just using this as an example for you, right? So I'm going to place the herbs, the formula, and I'm in my formula. This is one of my very famous formulas, by the way. I've been making it for about 50 years. So I take equal parts of an herb called Gotacola, which you can grow. It's like, um, it grows in the tropics, like if you visit in Hawaii, it's a wild plant in Hawaii, but you can grow it as a beautiful hanging plant, and uh, it looks a little bit like a violet leaf, and it just hangs and it'll grow all through the summer, um, and then 
that Godicola is a primary adaptogenic herb, a very important group of herbs that are used for overall enhancing overall health and well-being. So they're, we can call them tonics, adaptogens, they have many different names in different cultures. Um, but uh, Godicola has a, a long history of being used for memory. And in fact, in the Sinhalese mountains in the, uh, uh, and in India where this plant grows, uh, it's a primary herb that's used in these communities of people that typically live to be over 100 and they have never had senility or memory loss. Where in America, really in our generation, sadly to say, we see Alzheimer and dementia as a major, major issue here. I'm not saying Gotokola is the answer to that. I'm just pointing out that when you visit those tribes, they say, we eat Gotokola every day. So Gotokola is one of the herbs that we'll add. And we're just gonna add them in equal proportions. So I'm just gonna add my little Gotokola in equal proportions. Rosemary, how do you spell that? Gota, G-O-T-O, G-O-T-A, Gota, and then Cola, K-O-L-A. And here's my Gota Cola. Now, question, we, we gather a lot of herbs, should we dry them before we make them? Oh, very good question. So, should tinctures, be you use dried or fresh herbs? So that's another thing, especially with your alcoholic tinctures, they can be either dried or fresh. Yeah, so that makes sense, right? Higher percentage of alcohol or more herbs. <laughs> yeah, or more herbs because there's a lot of liquid in there and you already, you don't need that extra water because you already have water in your solvent or your menstruum. The other thing that you can do is you can do what I call dry wilting. Just, you pick it fresh, you put it in a shaded warm area, you let it sit for like two or three hours, like a bouquet of flowers you forgot to put in the water and you dry wilt a lot of the liquid out. So, and you can use both fresh and dried herbs in here. With vinegar tinctures, you wanna be a little more careful about the amount of moisture that's in a plant. So like if I was making a comfrey tincture or molen that has a lot of liquid, I would definitely dry wilt them before I used vinegar. Because vinegar, remember, is not quite as strong a uh, preservative as the, as the alcohol is. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. And then, um, so, and then the second ingredient is the ginkgo. I don't know about here, but on the East Coast, ginkgo is an ornamental that's planted in all the college campuses and roadsides and shopping centers. Uh, <laughs> this one I got, <clears throat> I was trying out my new electric blanket um, bike in the, <laughs> in the parking lot of the Walmart, and I noticed, oh my goodness, there was all these ginkgo trees. So I wouldn't say it's the best place, I would say, it was way in the back. I would say, you know, where you gather your herbs is really important. I shouldn't have told you that. <laughs> it is really critical. You know, you don't want to gather them in polluted areas. It was way in the back parking lot, right? And there was all these ginkgo trees that were just filled with these beautiful golden leaves. And they were right in my reach because they were young trees. So that is where this came from. <laughs> Talking about thriving and surviving. Yeah, thank goodness, right? <laughs> okay, so we're putting the ginkgo in. How many of you use ginkgo or know about ginkgo? So ginkgo has had a lot of research and studies done. It's an herb that has had some success um, stopping the advancement of Alzheimer's, early onset Alzheimer's and dementia. So, and usually when it's used that way, it's used in the standardized tincture or capsule. So they're using the chemical, the ginkgo site out. It's not really the whole plant. Important to know because it's such a problem in our culture. So anyway, these ginkgos are used for enhancing memory. And um, there's so much I want to share with you, but we just don't have a lot of time and I want to make this tincture. But So I will want to share with you one of the incredible things about this plant. It's the sole surviving member of an ancient genus of trees it used to cover this continent or this planet. And uh, they were going extinct in the 1500s and it was the monks who collected the seeds in the, in the monasteries and saved them and then sent them around the world to different botanical gardens. And that's the only reason that we still have ginkgo. This is the last surviving member of an ancient genus of trees. And I always think, oh my goodness, imagine if you were just the last member of your species mm -hmm. and the memories that would be encoded in you. So when I drink my ginkgo, I'm thinking about that, you know, like makes my head tingle to even think about it. <laughs> but then a lot of things make my head tingle. So there you go. <laughs> and talking about tingling heads. So rosemary is also a very powerful antioxidant. 
a very powerful, you know, we think of this as a little spice, but you know, when you use rosemary in your cooking, use a lot. This is an antioxidant. It's one of the most important. It's incredibly high in all kinds of nutrients and uh, infection fighting. It's, you know, has those incredible an antimicrobial properties and it has a long, long history of being used for memory. Remember Shakespeare, I, Rosemary for Remembrance. By the way, people always ask me, is Rosemary my real name? <laughs> and they think I was named after the plant, but I was named after my two grandmothers, my grandmother Rose and Mary. And I always say, oh my goodness, if my sisters had gotten that name, I would have had to fight them for it. <laughs> they have nice names too, but anyway, so Rosemary, and when you use Rosemary, so what takes, a, what takes a culinary herb from being a culinary herb to a medicinal plant? Because so many things in our kitchen closet are medicines, right? Almost every herb in your kitchen closet are important medicines like sage and turmeric and ginger. It's the dosage and the frequency. So rosemary, when you sprinkle a little tiny bit on your chicken, is a culinary. But when you cover the chicken so you can't see it with rosemary, it's a medicine. So it's the quantity that you're using, okay? So we're gonna put, so this is fresh. I picked it off the of Betty's plant. I hope you don't mind. And um, I just put it in there. And then I add a little peppermint. So the, the formula is equal parts of gota cola, equal parts of rosemary, uh, equal parts of, 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 uh, col, of ginseng, excuse me, and then about a quarter part of peppermint. Just a little bit of peppermint to give it a little kick. Ginkgo or ginseng? Excuse me, did I say ginseng? Thank you. I'm so sorry, I've been talking all day long, so I'm gonna, you're gonna see a little bit of dyslexia coming up here. Don't pay any attention to it. Okay, so then, so you fill your herb, you, you put your herbs in there, and then we're gonna always cover it by about approximately two inches of solvent or menstruum. Um, and then we wanna keep the herbs below the liquid. It's not such a big problem when you're making tinctures, especially your vinegar and your alcoholic tinctures. Like if the rosemary floats up, it's not gonna necessarily grow bacteria. But in a lot of the products that we make, like herbal oils, etc., where you have, or if I was making a glycerin tincture, an herbs floating above is going to grow mold. So I'm not overly concerned, but I always try to keep the alcohol above it. Yes, sir. And what are you making that? What is your, uh, your, your substrate? Is that uh, the alcohol or yes. the Yes. I think we're gonna make alcohol here, okay. right? Or I, it's from, okay, we're gonna, because we want it to be really strong. And by the way, I've had, really literally, I'm not kidding you, I've had thousands of people make this because I've had a home study course since, 1981, right, with thousands of students around the world. And so this is the first tincture I have them make. So I've had so many people write back. So how you know this is, well, let's finish the tincture and then I'll tell you how you know it's working. So you want brandy or gin in this, girls? Brandy. Okay. <laughs> so I have to say that's my alcohol of choice too. Um, and really, when I go into the er, to the liquor stores to buy alcohol, it's, that's the only time I go in. And I'm always, I don't know why I always have, because I'm coming out with bottles of stuff, right? I, I don't know why I always feel I have to explain to them. I'm an herbalist. I'm making tinctures. They couldn't care less. They look at me and go, yeah, right, lady. <laughs> but, um, anyway, so, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just fill this up. And a lot of times the herbs will rise above. You know, as I'm pouring it, the herbs float. So what you can do to eliminate, so you know what about approximately two inches above are, is you can make a little marker. Like you, let's say you mark this down here. So you take a little pen and just a little a Sharpie and just mark it. So then you're just gonna put that and this will all float up. It doesn't really matter. Um, and if I was using vinegar here, I'd put one of the fermenting glass lids on there. You could put a nice stone, a crystal, <coughs> pop it in there just to keep everything below. I don't worry too much about this. Then you always label, and I'm so sorry I forgot my labels, but I just want to share with you, I cannot emphasize enough. <laughs> Unless you're drinking gallons of your memory tincture, you're going to always forget what you put in here. <laughs> so always, always label. You label with date, ingredients, and then what you're using for extracting. Like I would put 80 proof alcohol brandy, and then I put each of the herbs in, and I put the date I set it up. So the periods of time that people let their tinctures sit really varies. So I would say my way's right. <laughs> no, but I usually say four to six weeks. 
I found that that gives you a really good, strong tincture. There are some books that will say seven days. That's not going to be strong enough. But also in the uh, Asian methods and like in traditional Chinese medicine, they let them sit for like six months or a year even. So the time, the variant is different. But usually within four to six weeks, this is really good. So one of the things I like to do, and I do in really think this helps, is you know you keep it on your kitchen counter. You let them sit up in a warm area. This does not go down into your cold storage because the heat is helping to draw. You know, keeping it in a warm place. You know, and then every day I shake it because the herbs can pack down on the bottom, and this just kind of gets it macerating. We call that term. This is macerating when it's sitting like this. It keeps it moving around. Um, and also, I always think it's good to put good intentions into your medicine. I do believe in energetic medicine. So you can pray, you can pray to God to make this good medicine for your community and your family and your neighbor. You can sing and chant, you know. And especially if you never do these things, I would really encourage you to. <laughs> so fun. Will you keep it in the dark? No, that really doesn't matter again. You know, I like to set them on my sunny window and... I used to write in some of my earlier books that, you know, alcohol in a sunny window can explode. And I think in really 50 years, I've heard one time, alcohol in sunlight, it's not the herbs. So just in a warm place, it doesn't have to be in a dark place. And I've made these for so many years, I've never ever had that happen. But, And I also don't like to just stick them away where I don't see them because I, the maceration just strictly on a physical is really good because it mixes everything. But it's really a nice time. you know. I always think, you know, like in the pharmaceutical companies, if you actually had somebody in there who was praying for your medicine, you know, and praying that this was really good quality and was really going to work well, and you would have better medicine. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to share, like, so tinctures. So this would be called a tonic tincture. It's not a medicine. A medicine would be something I'm making for colds or flus or fevers or bleeding. So a, a tincture, the, the dosage is hugely variant depending on the size. You know, like I'm going to obviously take a different medicine than my very large bear-like husband is and a little child. So when you ask for dosage, remember, it's, it's really individual. But generally we say for a, for, um, a tonic or a chronic long-term condition, it's about a half a teaspoon of tincture three times a day. Nobody ever takes that middle dose. <laughs> so a little more in the morning, you just forget, you know, but in, if you keep your tincture like in your bathroom or in your kitchen sink, somewhere where you see it, you take, because the thing is with the herbs, they actually do work. That's why people have been using them for thousands and thousands of years, but they don't work unless you take them. <laughs> so, you know, like I remember when I'd go make tea year after year and send it to my family and then I'd go, oh, there's like, the tea from 1968. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's a little bit of a story. But so in other words, um, you know, the, the, the tincture will work. You just have to take it. So how you would take this tincture if you decided to use this, it would be using it. Let, let's say you're just feeling like you've been under a lot of stress or working really hard or you're anxious about the world. Um, troubled about things, you know, and it just weighs you down and you feel like your memory isn't as good because there's so much burden on your shoulders or you've gone through a, um, like a serious loss or something, right? And so you're really shaky and so you want to try to enhance your memory. So one half teaspoon, ideally three times a day or more in the morning and more in the evening. There's nothing toxic in here except for the alcohol. So you can take more in the morning, you could take a teaspoon, right? And then uh, you do that for at least four to five weeks. So it doesn't work fast. The alcoholic tinctures, I always recommend that you dilute in a little water or juice. People take them straight, you can, but getting that dose of alcohol can be very overwhelming for your body. So I usually recommend a little bit of warm water or tea, just put your tincture in. You take that for about four weeks. And what you do is you begin to notice that you you remember where you left the list, right? Oh, yeah, I left that list. I know where it is. Then you remember what's on the list. Then you don't need the list anymore. You can go out in the house and go to the door and have like the 10 items that you need. You remember your husband's name. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> or your 25 grandchildren. No, it's, you know, it's... <laughs> can you take that on the plane with you? 
Well, you can take it up to two ounces on the plane with no, you. I meant that, that <laughs> no, Diane, I'm leaving it with no, you. That's good. That's what I wanted. Yeah, you have to shake it every day. So after the four to six weeks, after the four to six, because I heard you say brandy, that's why I put the brandy in. So after four, if Betty had hard vinegar, I would have left it with her. So after the four to six weeks, then you strain it. Um, you use cheesecloth over a stainless steel strainer. It's that simple. Like, you know. A large, ideally a larger strainer than this. Um, but I did want this size because we'll do some other things. And then you just lay a cheesecloth in there. You pour it through it and then you squeeze, kind of melt that bag. You know, you just get all the last of the stuff out. You discard the herb. It's been used. All the chemical constituents are in the liquid. You label your jar very carefully so you know what's in there again. And then, then this is stored in a cool, dark place. And it will last literally forever if you forget to take it. So. <laughs> to be aware of new videos like this one, be sure to subscribe to the Preparing for the Time of Trouble channel. For more free videos and downloadable audio podcasts, as well as handouts, go to www preparingforthetimeoftrouble.com. Topic categories include recordings of live seminar presentations, country living, sustainable gardening, homestead remedies, how to be self-sufficient when the grid goes down, wild edible and medicinal plants, hydrotherapy, and end-time Bible prophecies. To take advantage of these free resources, go to preparingforthetimeoftrouble.com. Dot com.